So the question really comes down to is how true is that for us? Like when we enter into this time right now and we say words like, you are so good, like do we believe it? And if we believe it, it just helps us get to another place in the moment we're about to go. It helps us get to a place where we're humble and we're ready and we're, we can receive. So I want to challenge each of us to think about that, to rest on that, to think about where we're, our minds are, our mindset. So Lord, we ask right now that you would open up our hearts and our minds to you. And Lord, as we sang a song that talked about how good you are, Lord, is it true to us? Do we believe it or do we just say it? An awesome opportunity within a type of worship to lift our voices in praise and song. God, but this right here, what we're about to do, where we have this one-on-one -on -one opportunity to invite you in, to have you challenge us, convict us, pierce our hearts and our minds, break us down and build us up. God, I pray that we would get out of our own way. God, I pray that you would help me to get out of the way and that your word would be so true and so strong right now. And God, that the place that we find ourselves in this moment would not be a distraction, God, I pray that we would worship you in our, with our ears right now, with our response. God, I thank you for the chance to be here today with my friends, God. And I pray that you would teach each and every one of us something so special that we've never heard or witnessed before but we'll be overwhelmed by at the end. God, I believe you are so, so good, worthy of worship, and I am so unworthy, and yet you let me stand here. So God, continue to give us a spirit of humility, a spirit of praise, a spirit of worship. Help us to learn right now and to be bold in it. We ask these things because of your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did upon the cross for us. And in his name, we all say, amen. 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 You guys can go ahead and be seated. Welcome to Impact Church. And my name is Mike, and I want to thank you guys for being here today, for joining with me as we continue in this teaching series in Malachi. And I do pray that this would be a uh, an awesome time together where we'll be able to sit down and learn. But you listen, this really comes down on you. You've got to decide right now what you're going to do with this moment, with this time together. Um, you know, we're talking about worship and meeting the God of worship. And what we just did together in, in song is only part of worship. This is one part of what God has blessed us with, an opportunity to lift our voices. And I am a true believer that music uh, is something that God created to reach us and, and uh, unlike any other thing that we have in this world. And when you do it in, in communion together like this today, it's powerful. It's powerful. And it gives us a chance to come before the throne in a humble manner and then for us to actually continue in worship as we look at his word today. So that's what I want us to do. I want us to dive into the word of God together this morning. And that involves two things that you need to do. One is to pull your Bibles out. Uh, and you're going to turn over to Malachi chapter 2. It's the end of the Old Testament. So if you run into the New Testament, uh, any of the Gospels, you're just going to go backwards a little bit. But you want to get to the book of Malachi, the second chapter. And that is in the Old Testament. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. You can raise your hand. And we will put a Bible in your hands. And you can take that home with you afterward as well. Uh, but we want you in the Word of God. And the second thing I want you to do is pull out your notes uh, that are found in your program. And you're going to be able to follow along and fill in some blanks and take home some bonus scripture and things like that with you as well this morning. So you want to be in the Word of God. You want to be in your notes. You want to follow along. The more you put in, the more you're going to get out. And this is an awesome opportunity for us to, to worship God with, uh, with doing those things. So we've been teaching. We've been going through this book of Malachi. We are in the fourth week. 
And uh, we are on the second chapter. We're going to wrap up chapter two today. And we've been talking about this idea of meeting the God of worship. And that's what Malachi is trying to uh, help us do. He's trying to give us an understanding of who God is and then give us a challenge as to what are we going to then do with that. And that's what this whole book is about. And that's what we're trying to, uh, to change and to work out in our hearts and our minds. Because the reality is who or what we worship is going to reflect upon how we're uh, the priorities that we have in our lives. All right, so what we worship is what we're going to put our time and our money and our energy and our resources and our, our gifts and our talents into. And if we want to worship something, we're going to give stuff to it. All right? It could be, again, like our time or our money or, our money or things like that. But what Malachi wants us to understand is he says, when you meet this God that I'm telling you about, you're going to then understand who he is, and then your heart is going to be turned to a place of worship in a way that you've never experienced before. But you are not going to want to worship this God if you don't first understand who he is. And that first week that we talked about that God is worthy of worship brought us to a place, and Malachi was explaining to us just how worthy of worship God is. Right, through his love, through his sacrifice, through his permanency, through who he is um, as a just God. But he also said that it's important for us to choose to do this. Like You've got to decide for yourself whether you're going to worship God. And then we, when we go through this, you know, and I'm trying to sit here and say, hey guys, you should worship God. Well, why should I worship God, Mike? Like, what's, why, why him? Why not somebody else? Well, the, you know, there's over 5,000 different religions in the world. Why worship God? This one God. Well, Malachi is saying, listen, when you worship this God, you're going to see things you've never seen before. You're going to meet a God that wants to be not only personally involved in your life, but someone that wants to help you guide your life. I, I saw a cool video yesterday, actually, in regards to this. You know, the guy was talking about how, like, all these religions in the world, right, and all of these religions talk about how you have to do something to go and meet God. Like, if you do this, you're going to go and you're going to meet God. But Christianity is the only religion where God is actually coming to us. It's the only one where he sent his son to us, where he's reaching for us. And that's the difference between what we worship, the one true God we worship, and what the world wants us to worship. And I think if we meet that God, if we see that God, if we understand who he is, our minds will then be shifted to a place where we want to worship him. We have a desire to do so. We want to get to know him just because we're, we're finally starting to see who he is and what he can do in our lives and why he wants to be there. So Malachi is all about meeting the God of worship. James brought us a great message in week two about the idea of bringing forth our best. Are you bringing your best to God, to God or are you just giving him your leftovers? All right? Are you sitting there saying, this is, the, this is everything I have. This is the best of what I have, God, and I want you to have it first and foremost. Or we just say, man, I had a really busy week. God, this, you just get what's left over. I'm tired. You just get what's left over. I got other priorities in my life. I'll do the, those things first, and then I'll give you what's left over. And that's not what God wants. He wants our best. Are we giving our best to God? Last week, we talked about, are you losing heart? Are you losing heart? Why are you losing heart? And we talked about the different reasons why we might be losing heart in our lives. Maybe our mindset is messed up. Maybe we're not focusing on the right things. And we're too focused on the things that are distracting us from where God wants us to be. That was my problem. My problem, I was focused on the, on the things in my life that were dragging me away from the purpose that God had for me. You know, a leaking car, a bill, a frustration. Those things were drawing. My mindset was messed up. I wasn't focusing in on who God was. Maybe we're living in sin in our lives. Maybe we're neglecting the call that we have. You know, maybe we're, we're, we're skewing the religion that we say we have. I don't know what the thing is that might be uh, bringing this mindset or this, this hardship, this losing, uh, losing of heart in our lives where we're just desperate and we're down and we're depressed. But he wants us to understand what that is so then we can attack it, we can go after it. Well, today we're going to be talking about the blame game. So Malachi chapter 2, verses 10 to 17 is where we're going to sit. So turn with me in your notes. Let's read those verses. Let's jump into this together. Malachi chapter 2, starting in verse 10. But when you guys are looking for that, you know, a biblical concept of worship involves praising God 
in giving him glory with our lips and our lives, with our words and our deeds, with our physical bodies and our spiritual hearts. Worship that pleases God is authentic, offered with clean hands and a pure heart. That's a great definition that we've been going through uh, in this entire series. You know, I think it gives us an understanding. It's not just about singing. It's also about how you live. It's about your words, your deeds. It's about what you're going to be doing with your lives each and every day. So a biblical concept of worship involves all those things. So where and how are we worshiping God? Let's look at chapter 2, the book of Malachi, starting in verse 10, and we're going to break down these verses together uh, this morning. Are you not, are we not all children of the same Father? Are we not all created by the same God? Then why do we betray each other, violating the covenant of our ancestors. Judah has been unfaithful, and a detestable thing has been done in Israel and in Jerusalem. The men of Judah have defiled the Lord's beloved sanctuary by marrying women who worship idols. May the Lord cut off from the nation of Israel every last man who has done this, and yet brings an offering to the Lord of heaven's armies. Here is another thing you do. You cover, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping, and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young, but you have been unfaithful to her, though she remained your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows. 15, didn't the Lord make you one with your wife in body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So, guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart and do not be unfaithful to your wife. 17, you have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? You have wearied him by saying that all who do evil are good in the Lord's sight, and he is pleased with them. You have wearied him by asking, where is the God of justice? Before we break these down a little bit, um, there's a verse in Luke chapter 16, uh, verse 10, that talks about how one who is faithful in the very little is also faithful in the much, and the one who is dishonest in the very little is dishonest in much. You know, when we break our vows, when we, when we are breaking these vows, we're also breaking the trust in, within a relationship that we have. And, you know, this, is a, this chapter, this section of, of verse, although it's appropriate uh, to discuss, you know, marriage and divorce and things within this, uh, this passage is not simply a discourse on divorce and the vows and the covenant of marriage, but it also gives us a great opportunity to understand that when we look at the big picture of the vows and the big picture of what's happening in our lives, if we're breaking these, the most covenant, the most sacred of these vows, then how can we be trusted with the smaller things? And I think that in Malachi right here, he wants us to more focus in on the vows and the things that are happening in our lives because he wants to address the elephant in the room that sits there and says, if you can't keep this vow, if you can't keep the thing that you say is most sacred in your life, then how in the world am I going to trust you with any of the other things that I have for you in this life? How can I trust you with this vow or this promise or this covenant that, you've, that I've given to you if you won't do the, the, the most basic and the ones that I've, that I've treasured the most in your hearts? Why can't you focus on that? Why can't you do this? And if you can't do that well, then how are you going to do the other things well? If I can't trust you with the little things or the big things, how am I going to trust you with, with anything? These promises are being broken. And if we claim to follow God, then we can't be breaking these promises, these vows, these covenants that he has given to us. We can't be living in this, this motion of sin in our lives. And although there's a lot of things, and, and listen, the marriage situation in Israel at this time with Judah, with Jerusalem, wasn't just this one problem of their covenants and their vows and their marriages. It was just one of the many problems that they had. And he wants to, and he's picking this one out, and he's saying, listen, you guys can't even keep this covenant. How are you going to hold to the others? I want you guys to see this. I want you to understand this. I want you to recognize just how important these vows are. 
I mean, there's also another parallel to this passage in that throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, we are called the bride of God, the bride of Christ. Right? Isaiah, Revelation, uh, Proverbs 30, all of these, are they call us, we are uh, the bride of Christ, the bride of God. And when you look at how he talks about, you know, how we've betrayed or how these men have betrayed the vow to their wife, to the wife of their youth, we see that there's this parallel between how God, he, he wants us to, to focus in and to see how important these promises are that we have to him that we've given to him. So how are we with these covenants, with these promises, with these things? Are we allowing these, you know, the, the, the things of this world to come in and to break and to ruin that covenant relationship that we have with him? So we're going to look at five different things throughout this passage that I've labeled truth bombs. All right, when I was writing this, some of the ladies that helped me with like the editing and putting this all together, like truth bombs, Mike, I'm not really sure that's the most like theological term we should use this morning, but I think it is. I think this is great. I think truth bombs, you know, they're there because they're one, they're, it, it, this is the truth. This is where it ends. This is the line. This is how it is. And it's a bomb. It hurts. It can hurt a lot. You know, when a truth bomb is laid on us, we're like, oh, that was a lot. And it hurts. So there's five truth bombs that we're going to look at this morning. And as we look at them, they may not all apply to you. Maybe only one of them applies to you. But you need to look at these, and we were, basically in this passage, God lays out five truth bombs that we have to look at, and we have to recognize, see, respond to, and understand. Well, the first one is, number one truth bomb, I am a child of the one true God. Verse 10 says, are we not all children of the same Father? Are we not all created by the same God? So if we say we're Christians, we're saying that he is my God. He's the one God. He's the only God. He's the only thing that I'm going to rely on and I'm going to focus on. And anything other, any other priority that I put above him is a sin. Any other idol that I put in place of him is a sin. And it's dragging me away from where it is that I should be. And God is worthy of our worship. We talked about that in week one, just how worthy of our worship he is. And we have to be careful that if we're going to sit there and say, oh, I love God, but we're not giving him our worship. We're not giving him our praise. We're not giving him our lives. We're not giving him my everything then is he really that one true God in your life? Or do we have other ones that are sneaking in, that are prioritizing, that are taking us away from who it is that he is and what it is that he has for us? See, we should have this one. Is he not the, the God that created all of us? Yes, he is, so therefore we should worship him in that way. And we shouldn't be allowing other things to come into our lives to take us away from where it is that he wants us to be. 1 John 3, 3, 1 says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. We don't, they don't see what it is that we're worshiping and why we're worshiping, and that's the whole premise of why Malachi, right? he wants us to see who God is. He is the one true God. He's the only one worthy of our worship. He's the only one reaching for us. Now, does he want a response? Yes, he wants a response. Is he due a response? Yes. There is nobody else worthy of our worship than him. Well, how do we reflect this in our lives? What does this look like in our lives? Luke 12, 2 says, The time is coming when everything that is covered up will be revealed and all that is secret will be made known to all. All right, we can fake it till you make it, right? We talked about that. It's easy to look the part. It's, either, it's easy to sit there and tell other people, this is what I am. But then when the reality, you know, hits and, and when we're faced, you know, to that wall, where we have to make a hard choice. Do we falter or do we worship? Are we going after him or are we going in a different direction and grabbing something else to fix the problem? Is he our one true God? The truth bomb is, I am a child. Am I, if I'm going to say that I'm a child of the one true God, then how does my life reflect that? I saw an interesting take on um, Matthew 18, the, the, the passage with the, um, the leaves, the 99 to go after the one sheep, the shepherd. You know, when we look at that passage, it's true this passage speaks on the fact that God will go after everyone and every single person is important to him and that he loves and he wants every single person in this world to come to him and to know him, and he will chase you. He will go after you. He will reach for you. But I thought it was interesting, the other side of it, when uh, it basically came from the idea of a child, where they said, well, what, what about the other sheep? 
And, it is, and I started thinking, well, what, this sheep, why did the sheep even leave the, the flock? Is it a flock? Is it a patch? I don't know what they're called. A group of sheep, right? Why did the sheep leave? He went to go find something, right? Whatever was in this group right there, he was bored with, and he decided that he wanted to go search for something else. And it's interesting to see that when he left what everybody else was doing, and he goes off on his own, that's when he finds the shepherd. He found the shepherd when he went off and he was looking and he was searching. and He didn't like what was happening right here. He didn't like what the 99 were doing or he didn't understand it. And he goes, and, and as he goes, that's where he meets the shepherd. And maybe too often we're so caught up with, the, with what everybody else is doing, what everybody else is worshiping, what everybody else wants to focus on, and we're missing what it is that he has for us. And maybe we just need to separate ourselves. Maybe just for a moment, so that we can see him in a way, in a light that we never have before. Because if I'm going to sit here and say I'm a child of the one and only true God, then my life should reflect that. And if it doesn't, that hurts. And it should hurt. So I am a child of the one true God. Truth bomb number two is I am unfaithful to my God. Look at verse 10 again. It says, Then why do we betray each other, violating the covenant of our ancestors? Judah has been unfaithful, and they've done detestable things. I am unfaithful to my God, often too. You know, when you look at this passage, you see what happens. These men... They, they had this covenant with God. They had the, youth, the, the wives of their youth, and they made a promise to bring them and to have a union with them. And then God had a, he actually had a reason for that union. He said that I wanted to bring more godly people through you into this world. I wanted your children to be godly. I wanted your children to follow me. And then what happens is as they're going through this life, they see this enticing thing over in the corner, and they're like, oh, that's pretty. Let me add that to my life. And it was these women that were in the nations around them that were slowly coming in. And, and they saw that pretty shiny thing and they said, I want to have that a part of my life too. So they either, either left the wife of their youth, then divorced, or they just maybe even added them to the family and had multiple. But they were bringing these things into their lives that, and these women were worshiping idols. And the point is they were bringing these things into their lives that were distracting them from the place where God wanted to be and the person of who God was. And they were sitting there saying, hey, look, look at this shiny thing. Look at that great thing. I'm going to add this to your life. And now God starts going down in the priority list. And we do this. We add enticing things to our lives. We look at it and we say, man, if I had that, it would be so much better. And we become unfaithful. Because in that moment when we meet God for the first time, the reality is there's really nothing else above him in that moment. Like, we are overwhelmed by who he is, and because we're overwhelmed, that's why we're, ex we're, we're accepting that free gift of eternal life from him. We're saying, I want to have a life that honors you, God, that I follow you with everything that I have. There's nothing else above him in that moment if you, when you get saved. It's unlike anything you're ever going to experience meeting God that first time, having Jesus become the savior of your life, but it's as you're going, and it gets hard, and it gets rough. And unexpected things happen, and then you're like, oh, man, look at this. Maybe that would help. Let me just bring this in. Oh, maybe that, that might give me a little bit more peace. That might give me a little bit more comfort. That might take off some of the stress. And we add these things into our lives, which then take priority over our God. And we become unfaithful. And we have to be really careful. This was mine this week. When I asked, like, you know, what's the, what's the thing for you? What's the big one? This was mine. Unfaithful. Because I get prideful. Maybe I'll get angry. And I, and I allow these other things to come into my life to make me feel better. And those aren't the things that will make me feel better when I'm angry or when I'm prideful. Or when I'm going in a different direction. I need to put God into it. And we all have to be careful. We have to be very careful of what are the things that we're bringing into our lives that are enticing us and drawing us away from the Lord. What's taking us away from that, that first love? James 4.17 says, Remember it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. And I know. I'm a smart guy. 
I know when those things creep in and I shouldn't, but I do. Maybe some of us might be sitting here saying, well, I don't know. What, what does that look like? How do I know what those things are? Well, maybe we need to seek them out. I mean, he makes it simple. He, it's this idea of sowing and reaping. We all can understand that. Whatever you put in the ground, that's what you're going to get out. Whatever you do, that's what you're going to get, right? The whole, I mean, the world has dumbed it down, right? You are what you eat. Eat junk, you're going to look like junk. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the reality is that's what we do, right? It's that easy to understand. It's simple, but yet we still fall for it all the time. Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Don't be misled, right? Don't be taken off path. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. All right, it's like a little barometer for us here to, to help us understand the pressures of life that are around us. Are we measuring it out? Are we recognizing it? Are we seeing it? Am I sowing things that are going to take me away from God, or am I sowing things that are going to draw me closer to God? Sometimes it's an easy answer, other times it's hard, but we have to have this bomb placed on our hearts right now. The reality is I'm unfaithful to God. Am I dealing with that on the daily? Am I dealing with that throughout my life? Let's look at verses 15 through 16. It says, didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to your wife of your youth. 16, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of, of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's army. So guard your heart and do not be unfaithful to your wife. Right there at the beginning of verse 15, he says, Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. Truth bomb number three is, I am redeemed by God. I am redeemed by God. He goes, didn't I make you one with, in body and in spirit? What does he want? He wants godly children. So guard your heart. Be loyal. Don't do the things that God hates. Don't leave the one true love that you had. Right? Because I am this, because I am redeemed, because I know what God has given to me, and from the get-go, God says, aren't you not a child of mine? Aren't you not redeemed by me? Aren't you not a person that I have loved and shown my love towards? If this is who you are, if you are redeemed, then why is your heart wandering from me? Why are you focusing on the things that this world wants you to focus on instead of the things that I have placed in front of you to focus on? Why aren't you staying faithful to that first true love? You know, to accept this gift and then intentionally live selfish with these selfish ambitions in our lives, it's mockery of what God has done for us. And that's the problem is we, we too often get so enticed by these things around us and then we, we throw back the gift that God has given to us in his face. He goes, listen, you are a child of God. You are redeemed by me. And although you are unfaithful, I still love you. How are you reacting to that? How do I react to the fact that I am redeemed by God? Am I mocking that? Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. I have been redeemed by his blood. There was a price to pay. I have been redeemed by a price. There was a heavy cost to the redemption of my life. 1 Corinthians 6, 20, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. So if you want that redemption in your life, you've got to look towards God to have it. And then once you have it, how are you responding to it? Are we taking that gift from God and are we mocking him by how we respond and how we live our lives? And if we have that, if we believe we are redeemed, if we believe we are loved, if we believe we are cherished, then number four, we've got to stop placing that blame on, on God. Truth bomb number four, I am placing the blame on God. 
Verse 17 says, you have wearied the Lord with your words. You know what that is? We have blamed God for the circumstance that I find myself in. God's saying, aren't you a child of mine? Aren't you created by me? And they're like, yeah. Then why did you break my vow? And then why are you coming back to me with tears and with groaning at my throne? Saying, God, why are you doing this? I'm telling you why, because you have not lived towards, you have not lived according to that covenant that you made with me, that vow that you made with me. And if you're not living up to that covenant on, on something so precious as your marriage vows, then how, are you, how can I possibly trust you with the other things that I have for you? With the things that I want for you? With the things that I'm challenged that I want to do with you? And then instead of, of looking and turning back to God and being redeemed by him, we sit there and we say, God, well, 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 why are you letting this happen to me? And we start blaming him. Because even after three truth bombs, we're still not getting it, are we? Man, I, one true God, redeemed by that God. And although I am unfaithful to that God, he still loves me. And it still hasn't clicked. So I start blaming God. And I'm placing this blame on God for the things that are happening in our life, in my life. You know, blaming God is left less often about us not understanding the circumstances in our lives than it is for us to actually just this, having this unwillingness to look into a mirror and to register for ourselves what's really going on. Like, we like to just look to God and point a finger and say, God, what are you doing? Instead of having an open hand of reverence and a posture of reverence to say, God, what am I doing that you want me to know that I can change? And we need to go from this to this in our lives. And until we do that, we are not going to have an opportunity to worship God in a way that we could which is fantastic, by the way. And it's more than just in the song together, which is great. I mean, I was standing over here, and I stopped singing during that bit of a cappella that we did it, and I was just listening to you. It was awesome, just being in a chorus. And that's great, but it's not just with my lips. What about my life? It's not just with my hands, but what about my heart? What does my worship really look like? And am I placing this blame on God? Proverbs 19.3 says, People ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord for it. I messed up. I'm the one that did that. And what I need to do is look in the mirror. And then when I look in that mirror, God says, Listen. I know you're unfaithful, but I forgive you. I know you're not worthy, but you're redeemed. I know that you brought other things into your life to try and find satisfaction and fulfillment, but I am the one true God. How do you respond? Satan wants us to point that finger, but we got to stop asking why and start focusing on him. Take that accusation away and start getting to that place of reverence to the Lord. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Changing the way that I think. If I'm, if I'm focusing on God, then those enticing things that are trying to get into my life, they're not so enticing anymore. Because I'm looking there. I'm focused on him. I see what he is. And when I recognize who he is, there's nothing that could be better than him. Like nothing can be better than him. So if I know nothing is better than him, then the things that are over here mean nothing to me. Those distractions don't mean anything to me. Because I see who he really is. I've met the God of worship. And now I focus in. Do I fall sometimes? Yeah, I do. But because I've met him already, it's a lot easier to come back. Because I've seen what he's done in my life. And I don't allow that snare to hold on to me. And I can't let it keep me down. 
That's why there's, there's actually a response that you have to do. Like, you've got to decide today what you're going to do with this. Just hearing these words is not going to fix anything. Your action upon hearing them is what's going to matter. So I am placing, am I placing that blame on God? That might hurt. Back page your notes, wrapping up last one. Verse 17, latter half of it says, How we have wearied him, you ask. You have wearied him by saying that all who do evil are good in the Lord's sight, and he is pleased with them. You have wearied him by asking, where is the God of justice? God, why would you let this happen? God loves everybody, so everybody's okay. And that's what the world says, right? Just do you. Number five, truth bomb. God loves everyone, but he is not pleased with everyone. He's not pleased with everyone. He's not okay with our sin. He's not okay with the things that we're doing that go against his will, his person, his character. And we've got to stop using God's love and grace as an excuse to live a life that we want, a life of self-gratification. Because it can't be about us. And if it is about us, then you're missing it. It's got to be about him. He's not okay with all the things we're doing. Yes, God loves us, absolutely, right? 1 John 4, 10, this is real love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take, our way, to take away our sins. But my sin is still the problem. Not God's reach. My sin. Isaiah 59 too. We talk about it every week. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Not because of his lack of reach or not wanting to reach. It's because of my sins. So does he love me? Absolutely. Does he love you? Absolutely. Absolutely. But what thing is keeping you from living in that love, receiving those blessings, having those things that the world cannot offer us? God loves everyone, but he is not pleased with everyone. So this is what you got to think about. How are these truth bombs reflected in my life? And what changes should I make because of them? What hit you hard? What hurts? Do you claim that he is the one true God in your life? That you are a child of God, yet you're not living that way? Do you claim to be redeemed by God, and yet you take that redemption and abuse it by living according to your own flesh? Do you recognize that you're unfaithful? Because we all are on the daily. Does that help us when it comes to making the minute-by-minute minute decisions in our life? It can, it should. Do we see just how much he loves us? How much he cherishes us? Because he does, he loves us, but that doesn't mean he's pleased with the way we're living our life. So if you've got to decide for yourselves what you're going to do with that. Like I said, for me, it was the unfaithful. I just let things get into my life that drive me nuts. Which is really stupid, because if it drives you nuts, why would you let it in your life? But it does. I recognize that I am an unfaithful person. But I also recognize that God redeems me. He forgives me, he loves me, he helps me. I also have to be careful not to allow that knowledge and that understanding and that truth to make me lazy. Ah, oh, I can get away with it. It's already done. He already forgave. No harm, no foul. That truth is a painful one. What sins in my life do I need to give back to God? Do I need to confess? Do I need to get rid of what attributes of my life are disappointing him? Isaiah 59, 2, we just read it, but every week we go over the same one. Our sins have cut us off from God. Your sins have cut you off from God. That's the thing we have to deal with. 
the initial response is maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you don't have that eternal security, that joy, that peace, that hope of what's to come someday because you don't have a relationship with the Lord yet. Your sins have cut you off. If you're saved, maybe you're living in a life of sin. We talked about that last week as well. Maybe I'm living in a pattern of sin and that's why I'm down. That's why I don't have the, the joy of God in me because I have too much sin. I'm dealing with it. I'm just living within it. Your sins have cut us off from God. Romans 3.23, we've all sinned. We all fall short of that glorious standard of God. Why is that encouraging? Because you can lay your dirty laundry out and you're not going to surprise anybody because every single one of us has sinned. We all fall short. So stop hiding it and just deal with it. We all fall short. We're all losers. That's not a nice thing to say. We're all, we've all lost. We all need Jesus. You're not a loser. You're awesome. Romans 6, 23, the wages of that sin is death. Why is that important? Because we care as people about how much things cost. Right? You went to the gas pump, you went to the grocery store, paid your kids tuition, paid your taxes. We all get bent out of shape about how much things cost in life. The wages of our sin is death. My death cost a life. That's how heavy it was. That's how expensive it was. So I should think about it. You should think about it. You should think about just how heavy of a price that was. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the answer. He paid that price. So now we can have that redemption. We can be free from the penalty that weighs on us. How do you do that? Romans 10. You openly declare that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Sounds easy. I mean, in theory it is, but it's a big thing too. And it's a hard thing to walk through. I know I'm going over right now, but they can't fire me, so I'm okay. <laughs> Here's the reality. His love for us is so great. And we don't recognize that because we're too distracted. But when we do recognize it, everything changes. Everything changes. And that's what he wants us to have. So it doesn't mean that things are going to get easier or the bad things are going to go away or the hardships are going to stop. What it does mean is that the hardships and the bad things and the things that the world wants us to rely on, they have no more value in your life. They don't hold you down anymore. They don't eat away at you because you have a joy and a God who redeemed you who loves you even though you're unfaithful, who is the one true and only God in this universe who reaches for us and allows us to respond even though we're crummy. I don't know what you want. I don't know what else, what other thing. And even if you don't believe me right now, don't you think it's worth the exploration? Don't you think you should think on this and, and register it and, and, and open this thing up and just see what it is that God is? And is he worthy of my worship? Is he worthy of my time? Is he worthy of my money? Is he worthy of my effort? Is he worthy of my energy? Is he worthy of, of the talents and the gifts and the time and all the things around me that I have? Is he worthy of it? I don't know. For me, yes. For you, I can't answer that. You've got to decide today if you want to meet the God of worship. And I promise you, once you meet the God of worship, everything in your life will shift. Everything will change. But you've got to decide to do this for yourself. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're listening online. But none of that matters if you don't decide to do this right now for yourself. So, Lord, we come before you and we ask you and we pray and we plead that you would break us down, Lord, and build us up. God, that you would do something that's never been done in our lives before. We would see you in light we never have before. God, I pray that you would humble hearts. 
as we invite you in, God. Some of us are calling out to you right now. I know you hear us, God. And I know you're here. So friends, respond to him. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and that's your first step. That's the first thing you need to do to meet this God of worship. It's worthy of our worship. Say this prayer where you sit between him and you. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that sin separates me from God. From the hope and the peace and the security that God offers. I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins today. I'm sorry. I want to make you the leader of my life. I want to ask you to to come into my heart, to save me, to redeem me. I believe that you love me so much that you died on the cross for me. I believe that you love me so much that you rose from the grave for me. And I want to follow you from this day forward. Friend, if you said that prayer, if you had said those words, if you, if you had that in your heart, in your mind, but you want to talk more, let's talk. Let's explore this. Christian, don't stay off track anymore. Focus in. Use this next time of worship, time of communion to write yourself with the Lord. To get back on track, to recognize who he is, to worship him with your actions and your response. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. We do it all because of your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did upon the cross for us. In his name we say, amen.